scientists and men and women who worked so hard to make all of these amazing artifacts possible. And I'd like for you, if you worked in any way on any of the Apollo program, or if you work today on any space program, to raise your hand, just so we can see. These are the people on whose back this house was built. <laughs> and it was also built and continues to have a heartbeat because of our docent emeritus, NASA emeritus docents who are here. Gentlemen, if you're an emeritus docent, ladies, or if you're a military docent, would you please stand so these people can see who keeps this place heartbeat going? Come on, Mike, stand up back there. Come on, Jay. Thank you, Benny. Thank you, Kenny. And of course, it's built on our astronaut friends. Dr. Don Thomas came down today to be with us. Thank you, Don. And of course, and of course, Dr. Schmidt, whom you'll meet in a moment. It is also born on the wings of the corporations and industries in aerospace. We could not do what we do in space camp. We could not do what we do at the Space and Rocket Center without the help of the corporations who support NASA and our military. And today, tonight, this event is being brought to you by Orbital ATK. And a friend of Dr. Schmidt from Washington, D.C., Orbital ATK, wanted to come and introduce him. So we are very delighted today to have one of those historic folks who's helped make this program what it is, Mr. Ed Fortunato, who's a Senior Vice President for Government Relations with Orbital ATK out of Washington, D.C. He has a heritage in Army Aviation as an Acquisition Officer and also worked in the Secretary of the Army's Office as a representative to Congress. Ed was also worked for Honeywell, which I'm retired from, so it's a great, another great government contractor. And he serves on the Board of Trustees for the National Defense Industrial Association. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ed Fortunato. Well, thank you very much. I was just commenting. I don't think we came to introduce me. It was to introduce uh, uh, Jack Schmidt. So you all have read his biography. You know uh, his accomplishments, you know, famed geologist, obviously the Apollo 17 astronaut, uh, senator from his home state of New Mexico. Uh, professor, I got a chance to meet him three years ago when I came to this company because he sits on our board of directors. Um, so here's something you may not know. Uh, my impression of being able to work with him for the past couple of years, incredibly insightful, incredibly thoughtful, courteous, humble, a tremendous American and just a pleasure to be around. And um, I hadn't met too many astronauts until I came to this job. And this is just kind of funny, and I'll walk off the stage. I was talking to his wife earlier. I met a lot of the, I met um, five or six of the Apollo astronauts, and then I met a number of the space shuttle astronauts. And, and I guess there were a, a good number of them that flew multiple times. And one of my discussions with one of them, I said, yeah, I said, you know, I, you know, I met Dr. Schmidt, you know, he's on our board of directors. And I said, oh yeah, great guy, you know. He only flew once. <laughs> and I thought to myself, and I know he's kind of joking, I said, that's true, but he went to the moon <laughs> and back. So uh, without further ado, it's my honor to, to introduce uh, our astronaut, Dr. Schmidt. I volunteered more than once, but uh, <laughs> they didn't listen. Uh, I have a, a few, uh, to start things off, some moon balls. Can, do we have some young people in the audience who can catch? Huh? Here you go, Nicholas. How are you doing? There you go. Hey. <laughs> oh, there we go. Oh! <laughs> Back. Re relay. <laughs> Where are we going here? I don't know, I think I wore my arm out earlier in the day. There you go. Well, now, let's see, we got some over there? Hey! Okay, we're gonna take a quick trip to the moon tonight. And uh, it's a little bit uh, uh, different kind of, can we get the lights off the screen? If they're pretty. Aren't they pretty bright on the screen? Yeah. The pictures all look better. 
Okay. Uh, I know this has been built a little bit about Mars, and I guess what I'll say first is that if you're going to go to Mars, you're going to have to do at least as well as we did with Apollo, all right? <laughs> and so we'll talk a little bit about Apollo tonight. The, uh, 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 this picture I like because it, uh, it symbolizes a lot about uh, the mission. Are you still getting a good view of the picture now? Uh, I'm a little close to it. Uh, whoops. Uh, it, you know, uh, it took the technology comparable to what's in that spacesuit to make it all happen, and the people who designed and built the, that uh, suit, uh, uh, that w was certainly a very important part of it, the technology base that made it all happen. Uh, we gained a great deal of science understanding about our own Earth as well as the Moon uh, by going there. Uh, the uh, Earth above the flag, of course, symbolizes that, as well as the mountain behind me. Uh, the South Massif, and, uh, and of course it was through the, uh, the support of the American taxpayer that it all happened. And I just want to remind everybody that the P Apollo program was a product of the Cold War. Uh, it was uh, a very important aspect of the Cold War, and its success had a great deal to do with the uh, winning of that war. I think that's pretty clear. As, uh, the former Soviet emigres that uh, have come, back, come into this country have made that clear. Uh, so, uh, just, it's necessary, I think, to remember that. The, uh, but, because of the uh, insight of a number of the NASA managers, uh, people like George Lowe and Verna Von Braun and uh, 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 Bob Gilruth and many others, uh, on the engineering side, they recognized that if we were successful, as they intended to be, that uh, a great deal of scientific exploration could be done. And they made that uh, possible. In fact, very early on, a Block II lunar module was being designed uh, that by the uh, Grumman uh, Aircraft Corporation that uh, at the direction of George Lowe. And that Block II was really what we flew. It made it possible to explore the moon for three days rather than just a few hours, uh, which uh, Neil and Buzz uh, were uh, forced to do. Uh, they wouldn't call it forced. I'm sure they appreciate the opportunity as much as I did. The, uh, uh, now, the Saturn V rocket, which uh, of course has its heritage here uh, in Huntsville, uh, was uh, really a magnificent uh, machine. It uh, weighed at fully fueled about 6.8 million pounds. Uh, it, uh, the thrust of the five F-1 engines in the first stage totaled about 1.7 million pounds. Uh, and it, uh, it performed basically the way we wanted it to every time we asked it to. Tremendously robust system. And uh, had, uh, had foresight been a little bit stronger, I think we would have kept that Saturn V open, uh, line open. It would have uh, made a, a tremendous contribution to the future of the country and to humankind. <laughs> Uh, but the decisions were made way back in the Johnson administration and confirmed in the Nixon administration to limit that by uh, to just 15 rockets. And, uh, uh, and so uh, we were limited initially to just uh, uh, going to the moon through Apollo 20. And even the last three of those missions were canceled. And one of the rockets, I believe I'm correct, that, uh, that was not flown to the moon is now in this building. So uh, it's, just, uh, it's just great to have it here so you can experience it, but it would have been even greater had it done its job <laughs> one more time. Uh, the, uh, to give you uh, some idea of scale, uh, that's the vehicle assembly building at the Kennedy Space Center, and down in the lower right, you see a very large fire truck. Uh, that red spot down there is a large fire truck. Uh, so uh, uh, it really was a, a magnificent effort. And one thing I like to remind people of is that uh, in the early days of Apollo, between November of 1968 and November of 1969, 1969 we, we flew one of these rockets uh, every two months. Uh, that's a remarkable accomplishment. And it was done by people mostly in their 20s. That's something else that you need to remember when you start talking about going to Mars. Okay, it ne the people who do it will be young or need to be young. Okay, that's the launch of Apollo 17. The, uh, uh, let's see, yes. See these spots right here? Can you see those? Those are pretty large.
fragments of frost that are coming off the side of the rocket. The first stage, uh, five first stage engines create a very heavy low frequency vibration, fortunately, because we stayed on the pad for two hours and 40 extra minutes, and uh, we got a lot of Florida frost on our sides of our very cold tanks. And uh, most of that came off uh, on the, uh, very early in the launch sequence, so we didn't carry it very far. A little bit of it was still on the third stage rocket when it shut down after translunar injection. Uh, and we had this cloud of ice fragments that uh, were right around the S-4B. Uh, and uh, we couldn't figure it out for a while what it was. Some people, we thought it was paint or styrofoam or something like that. But I'm absolutely convinced it was pieces of frost, that uh, Florida frost that we took, to, we took to the moon. And actually, probably, if it didn't evaporate before it got there, probably impacted the moon. I just thought about that the other day. Okay. Now, the spacecraft, uh, very important because that's what got us there, command and service module in the upper right, the uh, uh, lunar module in the uh, lower right. Uh, America was the name of the uh, command and service module that Ron Evans piloted, and the uh, uh, Challenger was our lunar module. And that, as I indicated earlier, was a Block II lunar module capable of staying on the moon uh, for three days uh, with a very significant payload called the ALSEP, the Apollo Lunar Surface Science Experiment Package. The, uh, now, after we left uh, the uh, confines of Earth orbit and uh, we're headed to the moon at about 25,000 miles an hour, uh, I was able to take this picture from about 34,000 miles away of a nearly full Earth. If you look very carefully, uh, there's a uh, typhoon going ashore on the subcontinent of India. Uh, you have these beautiful patterns of relatively undisturbed anticyclones going about Antarctica uh, and the South Pole, uh, from uh, which those weather patterns originated. Uh, we were looking at the southern hemisphere throughout most of uh, all of our mission uh, because of where we wanted to land uh, in the northern hemisphere of the moon. And I'll let the kids sort of explain all that to you. <laughs> why that was necessary. The, uh, uh, I, I had, uh, this picture actually was a part of a long series of pictures of the Earth that I started taking well before this uh, in order to illustrate weather patterns that I was trying to describe uh, over the uh, air to ground and filled up several vo uh, volume of transcript on that first uh, several days. It took three and a half days to get to the moon the, uh, uh, all of that time I was able to observe these weather patterns, a hobby of mine throughout uh, my childhood as well as uh, into uh, my piloting uh, experiences was to try to understand weather patterns and to uh, make some conclusion on how they might change over time. And fortunately in our, uh, since we were referenced to the moon by the time we uh, left the earth, uh, we were seeing the Earth rotate every 24 hours beneath us. And so I could try to forecast a weather pattern uh, over Australia or someplace uh, one day and see if I was right the next day. It, uh, it, not many people get that opportunity, believe me. <laughs> the, uh, uh, our Apollo 17 was going to land up there in a deep mountain valley or that uh, uh, was cut into the uh, uh, the uh, ring of mountains surrounding a, a basin called Serenitatis. The, uh, I, for reference, uh, Neil and Buzz landed about there in the southern part of the Sea of Tranquility. Uh, we were about 600 kilometers north and somewhat east of where they landed. In fact, uh, we had a relatively short time uh, coming around the moon to get state vector updates and things like that. Uh, before we went into our power descents to uh, uh, land on the uh, surface. Uh, that valley of Taurus Littrell is shown here in this picture. It's about 50 kilometers long from upper right to lower left, uh, about seven kilometers wide in its narrowest point. Our landing point was uh, going to be there, and Ron Evans again in the uh, command module America uh, was at this point doing navigational sightings on some small craters in the valley near our landing point. 
the reason this was important is that those craters had been, uh, uh, the position of those craters had been determined relative to the center of mass of the moon. And that's what we, of course, needed to uh, reference in order to land uh, precisely where we wanted to. And, uh, and that information that Ron gathered by those uh, what were called landmark sightings uh, was shipped back to Earth, uh, was processed, and then shipped back to us, corrected for where we were relative to him. Uh, and that made our knowledge of our landing point much, much better than it would have, have, have been otherwise. Uh, it, without that uh, very late update in what we call a state vector, three vectors of position and velocity, uh, we would not have been able to land in this valley. Uh, the very conservative error ellipse that they had would have uh, included the mountains on either side, and we didn't want to land on the mountains. But I, I, again, I say that was very conservative. I think it would have been fine. But they still, they finally got that ellipse down to about a kilometer diameter. And uh, so it was everything, and that's, and we landed within about 100 meters of where we planned, planned to land before we left the Earth. Really remarkable navigation techniques. Now, uh, this is a picture of our landing site and the Lunar Module Challenger descent stage right there. This picture was taken relatively recently by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter satellite that is uh, in orbit around the moon today, still operating. Uh, it's into its third, I guess, third or fourth uh, 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 mission uh, sequence and is gathering a tremendous amount of information for our future uh, landings on the moon, uh, for both site selection and for navigation. Uh, the uh, LRO is just a remarkable spacecraft, has many, and it has cameras, as you can see here, capable of resolving uh, the, uh, uh, the, not only my footprints wandering around here, going out to where I deployed the ALSEP, uh, but also the lunar rover tracks are visible in this area. Right, there's some right there. And those aren't very wide, they're about this, this wide. Uh, and the reason you see those tracks around the uh, spacecraft landing point is that uh, during landing, the uh, effluents from the descent engine winnow fine dark particles away from the surface and make it lighter. You get very far away from here and it's awfully hard to find our tracks or our, either from the rover or from our walking. The, uh, and one other thing that the, lunar, uh, that the LRO has done is found that uh, the uh, American flags we deployed on six missions are still there, still flying. Uh, they, uh, uh, that surprised a lot of people, including myself, because they were nylon. And this is a very intense uh, ultraviolet environment. You would expect nylon to have deteriorated and not cast a shadow. But it does, and my understanding is that DuPont that made the flags is trying to find in the archives what formula they use. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard if they've been successful. Okay, my first view though, out the uh, right-hand window of the lunar uh, module, Challenger, uh, is this. Those, uh, the base of the mountains are about uh, uh, five kilometers away, and uh, the uh, this is a very typical surface, what we call a Mari surface of the moon. In fact, practically anywhere you land on the moon is going to look something like this because there's a there multi-meter thick layer of debris that's been created by the impact of meteors over extended periods of time. In, in our case, there have been meteors forming this uh, debris layer, or regolith as we call it, for about uh, uh, 3.7 billion years. Uh, so. Uh, it gets fairly deep. And also, in our case, material from the mountains has been knocked in there, and it's added to that. And we've had volcanic uh, ash eruptions in the valley, which have added. So we had about nine meters of this debris, average depth, in the valley. Uh, if you want to compare that with Apollo 11, our estimates of, uh, of the regolith that uh, Neil was walking on there was, is about th six meters. So we have an extra three meters of material that's probably been uh, introduced. The, but th those are very rough estimates, so don't, uh, don't think that that's a very, those are very accurate. That's the, uh, this uh, metallic looking object there is indeed a metallic looking object. It's, uh, it's one of the 16 thrusters that we had on the spacecraft 
to uh, about 50 pounds thrust uh, that allowed us to or to uh, fly the vehicle in in space and during landing it helped keep control of the uh, orientation of the vehicle that uh, 50 pounds thrust so you need to compare just in your own mind with the 1.5 million pounds of thrust of an F1 engine and and we had several propulsion systems in between there uh, on the spacecraft so it was really a very uh, a robust technology of that time that was developed. Uh, about two EVAs later, this is what that same area looked like uh, as a result of our tromping around and, and stirring up the regolith. The regolith surface has a pretty high bearing strength. You don't sink into it uh, significantly. Uh, but after you walk around a bit, you do stir it up. It's like damp beach sand, if you want a, uh, an analogy. Uh, and it is slightly coherent, uh, cohesive, excuse me, and, uh, uh, but uh, once it's disturbed, it, it looks like what you see here. And so those of you who go to the moon in the future are gonna have to figure out some way to stabilize that surface if you're gonna have high traffic areas. Uh, and I, I, there are a number of solutions to that. You can go the old Scottish solution of just gravel macadam, as they called it, or, uh, or you can, uh, um, our, our old friend, uh, the late Larry Taylor suggested we might wanna have a microwave machine that would go along and partially melt it as it went along and create a pavement. Uh, there, I'm sure young engineers are gonna figure that out uh, before we uh, have any significant problem with it. If you want to work on the moon, camp out, this is what you need. Do a little geology at the same time. You need a camp, which you see there, the Challenger. You need a spacesuit, which you see uh, me uh, demonstrating at this point. Uh, that uh, spacesuit really was another spacecraft. Uh, the only thing it didn't have that spacecraft have is it is uh, uh, thruster systems for mobility, you, but they had me inside, so that was our mobility system. Uh, the uh, uh, lunar rover that uh, came out of the Marshall Space Flight Center uh, is uh, right there underneath the flag, and of course the, uh, the flag there again uh, is something you need to have. You need to have that kind of support and, and focus in order to make these kinds of human activities possible. Now, I, I don't show you this picture just to convince you that I was young once, <laughs> uh, but to uh, help uh, maybe demonstrate just one simple thing. For this spacesuit, spacecraft suit that we had, anything in blue here is an inlet port. Oxygen, water for cooling, and the like. Anything in red is an exit port. Uh, the, uh, we were circulating oxygen uh, through a backpack that uh, primarily would remove carbon dioxide from that oxygen, and then you reuse what uh, uh, the oxygen there. It was pure oxygen. The pressure that we used uh, on the moon was about 3.8 pounds per square inch, and uh, it uh, really serviced us very well. For the future, and I'll mention Mars again, as well as going back to the moon, we need suits that will uh, withstand 100 cycles of use rather than three, or pick a number, but it's gotta be a lot more than three. And, uh, and they have to be easily refurbished uh, after that time if you're going to start to spend a lot of time uh, on the moon or a lot of time on Mars. Uh, I think that's a very important area of investment that has to be made. And, and some of it is, but probably not to the level that needs to be done for, for the long term. And there's the suit again, uh, yours truly. The, the earth weight of this suit, backpack, and yours truly there in that picture was about 370 uh, pounds, earth weight now. Divide by six, and you know what it weighed on the moon, which wasn't very much. So it was pretty easy to move around, even though the suit, the suit was fairly stiff. Uh, in fact, I found a cross-country skiing technique was very good for moving across the surface. Of course, you glide just above it rather than on it. Uh, but you can uh, move efficiently and quite rapidly that way. Uh, the, uh, the only real physical difficulty of using the suit was, uh, was in the gloves. And uh, the, uh, of course, it's a pressure glove. Uh, there were no mechanical assistance. And anytime you squeeze it or pick something up, it's like squeezing a tennis ball. And we worked for, uh, we were pressurized for more than eight hours in that suit. So you can imagine that your forearm muscles uh, need a lot of conditioning. We thought we had conditioned them uh, uh, pretty well. It was a lot of, I did a lot of 
of work on that, but it's nothing like what the shuttle astronauts did in assembling the uh, space station. Just a remarkable uh, physical training reg regimen that they uh, went through in order to build up those muscles. They did much better than we did, and uh, had we understood that problem better, I think we could have done it. So in the future, that's going to be one of the main physical training issues for you future astronauts, and that is uh, if we don't get a suit that has some kind of me a mechanical advantage that helps you out. The, uh, uh, this uh, is Shorty Crater, uh, a picture on the, the craters on the right. It's where we found the orange soil. The or famous orange soil turned out to be volcanic ash. Uh, little tiny beads, about 40 microns in diameter on the average, uh, that uh, had erupted there about three and a half billion years ago. And uh, uh, we, we were very, very fortunate that it, it had been protected where in this one spot uh, for that three and a half billion years by a layer of impact ejecta that just went out on top of it a few tens of millions of years after it erupted and protected it until Shorty Crater exposed it again. Uh, the Shorty Crater being an impact crater in its own right. Uh, so, you know, sometimes geologists have to take advantage of coincidence, and, <laughs> and this was certainly one, and it's turned out to be a very important uh, sample. Indeed, they've even found inside uh, some of these beads of glass uh, indigenous lunar water that has come from the deep mantle of the moon, and uh, maybe the source of the water ice that we now see at the poles of the moon. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, it's telling us an awful lot about the history of the moon. <clears throat> this big boulder that you see here, and you're surely for scale on the left, uh, this had rolled down the uh, side of the north wall of the valley, the North Massif, uh, rolled about a kilometer and a half. It must have been a sight to see, bouncing down the mountain in one sixth gravity. And it hit a change in slope and broke into five different pieces, and that's why it stopped. And, and fortunately, this was one of the few boulders we could see on the pre-mission photography, the low resolution uh, photography uh, that had been taken by the Apollo 15 mission. And, and so it was a, a prime uh, a point for uh, uh, visiting for geological information. And it, it turns out that uh, through age dating, uh, this rock uh, was formed by an impact, melted and, uh, by an impact about uh, 3.9 billion years ago. Uh, a, a, a basin forming impact called Crisium uh, apparently uh, formed this. Uh, and uh, it uh, has told us a great deal about this very violent period in solar system history. Uh, the first billion years of solar system history was extraordinarily violent, including here on Earth, at the same time that life was evolving here. Uh, at least complex molecules were being formed uh, in, a, in an environment that, where basins as, as big as uh, 3,200 kilometers in diameter were being made. Uh, continental scale impacts were forming uh, in the inner solar system during that time. That's the lunar module there off in the distance. I think some of you may be able to see the light colored area around the point of that arrow uh, that uh, again is that uh, winnowing of dark particles by the descent engine. Just another uh, shot from a, a different direction of that same big boulder. And if you look above my head there, you'll see that the boulder looks like it's uh, sort of uh, pockmarked or honeycombed. And it is. It's, f it's got these big, what we call vesicles in it, that used to be filled with some gas. And we're still trying to figure out what the gas was because it didn't change anything around the wall of the vesicle. It, it migrated out, but it didn't change anything. So it was almost certainly wasn't water. Uh, my best guess is it was mostly hydrogen. Uh, but uh, now we have to figure out where that hydrogen came from. <laughs> the, uh, now after uh, the last of our uh, EVAs, our excursions on the moon, uh, I think I was looking a little bit tired. I certainly was looking dirty and dusty. Uh, and so uh, very quickly we got out of the suits and into our uh, <clears throat> underwear. NASA, of course, called it, had to call this constant wear garment, but it was basically underwear, much more comfortable than the suit. The suit was made to be pressurized, so when it wasn't pressurized, it was 80 pound earth pounds on your shoulders, and it just wasn't, uh, wasn't a comfortable thing to have on very long. 
Well, we left the moon after about 75 hours. Uh, Gene Cernan asked me to go outside and get a really good picture of liftoff. <laughs> but this picture will have to do, taken off television monitor. Uh, we'll leave that up to future settlers on the moon to get good pictures of liftoff. It, I guess it must have been spectacular if you were standing out there. Uh, I wouldn't stand too close, though. The, uh, uh, I, I'll skip back a little bit. Is you know, some, uh, People often ask me, well, what would you do if that Assen engine hadn't ignited, the one that I just showed you? That one. Well, we had a lot of different ways to get that engine ignited. Uh, uh, a lot of redundancy and backup and things like that. But in the final analysis, if it hadn't ignited, we had something that you probably all have in your pickups, and that's jumper cables. <laughs> and the idea was that uh, one of us, whoever had the best, the lowest leak rate suit, would go outside and attach these jumper cables to batteries in the descent stage, take them back up into the, uh, well, they'd be still being held in the cabin, and then once, hopefully, the other person who went out was back in the cabin, you would attach the uh, other ends of the jumper cables to two circuit breakers that uh, would immediately open the valves of the, uh, the engine and you would be on your way trailing that jumper cable behind you, of course. <laughs> and, and the door flapping in the, uh, what you might call the lunar breeze. Uh, but we had it on board. We never obviously had to use it. Uh, but it's always good to remind yourself to be prepared, right? Always think about what your options might be. And there's the ascent stage that took us uh, for a very rapid rendezvous with Ron Evans. Uh, and. Uh, once we were uh, close enough to get for him to take this picture, uh, he uh, then uh, attached a uh, command module, command and service module to the lunar module, and we were uh, uh, ready to take another couple orbits of the moon and then come home. Uh, Ron was quite a, uh, uh, you know, he spent three days alone in the spacecraft. All the command module pilots had to work up there alone while we were on the surface. But he had a lot of different things that he was working on, uh, both planned and unplanned. One of the unplanned uh, activities that he undertook was to demonstrate to the <coughs> fuel cell engineers that some of the hydrogen uh, that they uh, used to create electricity and water by combining it with oxygen uh, was leaking into the water. And he's, he's been able to get hydrogen bubble all cold coalesce together in a, in a food bag here. That food bag it was our experimental bag of choice. It uh, consisted of salmon salad. Uh, salmon salad doesn't tra travel well. In fact, salmon doesn't travel well. Uh, it wasn't spoiled or anything. It's just, you know, one of those things. So nobody ever ate it. It was always appeared uh, in our, on our menu, but uh, most of it came back home. So if you see salmon salad in the, in the Space and Rocket Center here, uh, just remember, it's something we brought back, probably, <laughs> not something that we actually ate uh, while we were in space. The, uh, well, we, uh, we did finally leave the moon. This was our entry, my entry, into the, uh, into the Earth rising over the moon sweepstakes, which uh, Apollo 8 already won uh, with the first mission, which uh, photographed this uh, scene. And really a remarkable sight to see, and it also meant that you had uh, acquisition of signal uh, from the Earth, and they had it from you, and you indeed would have been uh, on your way home, provided it occurred at exactly the right time. And it did for us as it did for everybody else, and uh, it just uh, was a remarkable experience for me, and I think a remarkable, even more remarkable experience for the country as a whole.